I thought I'd start us off with uh, a, a curveball. Uh, because I think that it's more exciting that way when you don't see it coming. So this actually builds on a conversation, Tobin, you and, and, I, you and I had. Uh, I learned recently that, Gregory, you are from Albany, New York, originally. And Tobin, I know you spent some time in Syracuse. Yes. I wonder, do you think that there is something unique to the New York <laughs> landscape that inspires Gothic literature? And if there isn't something unique in the landscape, can you talk a little bit about your upbringing and how it contributed to your work as it stands today? Well, it's just in terms of uh, upstate New York, I, do think <laughs> so. I mean, the oldest Gothic novel in, uh, in America is um, Charles Brockton Brown's Wieland, right. which actually is based on a, um, uh, like a family murder that took place in upstate New York, a farmer who murdered his, uh, his family. A real story. A real story, yeah, sorry, right, yeah. Right. And so this was, uh, he took this up. Ripped as from a, the headlines. Pardon me? Ripped, Ripped from, the, from headlines. the headlines. Exactly, right. <laughs> and my experience, at least, in, um, in upstate New York, New York, I went to Syracuse. I got my MFA at Syracuse University. Um, really was in line with that. I mean, Rod Serling, he's from Syracuse. Uh, when I was at Syracuse, um, a uh, serial killer lived right next to me, as it turned out. A uh, human arm was found in my parking lot. Um, Did you it, put it there? <laughs> no, I didn't. You know, here's the creepy thing. It was the Domino's Pizza Delivery Boy. Ew, no, I'm not kidding, not. no. It was his arm, or he No, did? no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He had to Sorry. deliver with his left arm. <laughs> exactly. Well, and after he disappeared, the meat was never have as you, fresh on the pizza. Have anymore. you ever ordered pepperoni pizza since that time? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, anyway, um, so my experience of it was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, um, it was a very Rod Serling kind of place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All I can say is gothic horror begins in the family. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, since I uh, was from a family that was, that was devoted to language and to storytelling and intensely skeptical about the burgeoning TV culture, of the uh, late 1950s when I was uh, around and, and beginning to be sentient. Uh, and also was not, you know, not very uh, prosperous. So we were raised by my father, my stepmother, and the public librarians. And mm. all the gothic horror you need is, <laughs> is in the face of a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> that was a cheap joke. Actually, actually I loved, I, I did feel that the gothic librarians were like uh, they were like Miss Clavel, <laughs> you know, they, they just had your best interests at heart all the time. And they knew when you came and you had all those sports books, but underneath, uh, you know, a after, after Maddie hits a slugfest and, <laughs> and, 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 and Big Joe's Big Day and the touchdown, mm -hmm. underneath it was, you know, Organdy and Burgundy. And you, they knew you weren't getting that out for your sister. <laughs> but they let you get it out anyway. They didn't say anything. <laughs> But there's also the gothic nature of like, uh, you know, the um, early John Belair's books oh, yeah. have, um, their, one of their settings is in fact, oftentimes, a big uh, Carnegie library in mm -hmm. a small town. Yeah. And I feel like that for a lot of us uh, readers and writers, it is a sort of a gothic experience. You know, you, not only do you have the little Romanesque arch, the little brick spire and that yep. kind of thing, mm -hmm. but I mean, literally the experience of going into those stacks as a kid and seeing the whole world of knowledge laid out for you in a labyrinth, you know? I mean, it's a tremendous experience. Well, the Hudson River Valley is, is a way to time travel. Mm. I mean, really, from, mm -hmm. from New York up to Albany. You mean uh, the train's really slow. I, I, mean, I mean, Van Winkle's still there. You know, I mean, you know, Washington Irving, 1817, mm -hmm. the, the Rip Van Winkle is, mm -hmm. is I think, the first uh, the first American uh, ghost story, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. as gothic as they come, and a little bit before Vland, isn't it? I think was Vland in 1824. It was, it was it was a little earlier, but oh, okay. it's not ghosty. But, yeah, mm -hmm. but it, I mean, so so we we come by it honorably, I think, mm -hmm. in, in upstate New York, and we all escape it as quickly as we can. <laughs> <laughs> well, just continuing the idea of um, of your own lives and and how it relates to your own work. Um, there's a contrast I'd like to draw between the two of you. I, you both write extensively for children and for young adults, um, for adults as well, but per with particular affection, I think, for children and young adults. And I know, Gregory, you're a dad. You have three kids. And Tobin, you are not a dad. Mm -hmm. And so I'm actually a little curious to hear your thoughts on writing for a young audience and how your own family lives either do or do not inflect your work in that regard. <laughs> 
<laughs> Do you need a glass of water? Where's, where's my nitroglycerin? <laughs> 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 the kids may be watching yeah. this one. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, had, I was at a, a conference uh, not too long ago. No, it was actually a fundraiser the night before last. And it was, it was I think, called Raising a Reader. And I said, I hope they're not going to ask me to talk. <laughs> because I'm striking out on Raising Readers. Uh, our kids are reluctant readers mm -hmm. in their t in their early teens and, and mid-teens, and no amount of doing the things that my parents did, like modeling reading every day, mm -hmm. like like mm -hmm. like having you know like keeping the TV from them, mm -hmm. uh, none no none of that none of those strategies mm -hmm. have been effective at making them uh, s feel the urge to pick up a book by their own, by, mm -hmm. by the emotion of their own hearts. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had a long conversation with your daughter, this is true, about Dance Moms, for example. <laughs> the uh, television show in I've which seen, uh, I've seen I've Dance Moms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's so, so, um, so I have had to, f to, to forge on mm -hmm. writing sort of in the, in the in the blackness and in mm -hmm. a, a somewhat depressive uh, zone, I, I guess I'd have to say, thinking my kids aren't going to read this, and I don't know if any kids are going to read this. Mm -hmm. In fact, I had trouble beginning this book, I, I, which is set in 1906, roughly 1907, Russia, mm -hmm. and I I knew sort of what it was going to be about, and I was aware that all my kids were having trouble reading. And I was having a hard time starting it because your mood was getting in my way, which had never happened, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the first 33 books that I wrote. <laughs> but mood was getting in my way about this one. And it was the, um, it was the British American fantasist Susan Cooper in, in the car once who heard me talking about this. And she said, you remember what Sendak used to say, don't think about, you know, who's going to read it. Write mm -hmm. it for yourself. Write the book mm -hmm. that you want to read. And I had always done that before, mm -hmm. but at this particular juncture of parenting, I had lost my way. Mm -hmm. And it was very helpful mm -hmm. to hear that credo once again, write the book that you would want to find on the library shelf or on the bookshelf this year. Mm -hmm. Write it, give mm -hmm. it to yourself, and then somebody else might like it too. That's always mm -hmm. how it's worked mm -hmm. in the past. But I needed to be, I needed a little booster shot, mm -hmm. and it was effective. Well, here's a question that's maybe slightly selfish on my end, because my, my next book is a young adult novel, and uh, I teach teenagers much of the time, but I hadn't been one for a little while. And so I have one on loan. I don't have children myself, but I have a 19-year-old who, who lives with, with our family. And, uh, and he's been great for, uh, for giving me slang. I can test out <laughs> slang on him. Oh, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, uh, and, and I love mocking him be with Twitter. Because by the time the book comes out, it it'll be dated. No, I understand that. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and I, like, I like playing tricks on him with Twitter and things like that. But it, one of the things that was interesting, at least for me, was to try to think about a way into an, an authentic young voice. Because mm -hmm. the last thing I was going to do was go back and read my high school journals. Nobody should ever mm -hmm. have to do that. So it was, yeah. it was one thing that I spent a lot of time doing. Do you find yourself listening to the way that your children talk or the way that they engage with each other? And does that, has that changed your work as I, they've I, gotten I, I'm older? I'm going to pass this to Toba because I don't listen to my kids. Oh, okay. uh, I don't listen to his kids either. That would be really <laughs> creepy. Right? Do you listen to any kids? We, we live quite far from each other. And he doesn't have enough shrubs close to his house. But you have Skype. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, really, it's a really good question, uh -huh. that question of the authenticity of the mm. vernacular, yeah. especially as pertains to a generation that is too far for you to, to, to live with yeah. yourself. And I really am curious because you do it really well. In fact, having just slagged off my kids for the first and not the last time tonight, I will <laughs> admit that uh, about four days ago, I said pretty much by memory the, your, the first um, sentence of feed mm. to mm -hmm. Alex. Mm -hmm. And Alex laughed out loud. Oh, good. Yes. Said, <laughs> that sounds good. I said, well, that's just the first sentence. There's more, there's more sentences in there. And he said, no, I think I got it. <laughs> he really did. That kind of encapsulates the whole thing. But real, how, do you, how do you do it? Because well, I mean, um, for one thing, I mean, that book, Feed, was actually written, um, you know, I mean, what, 12, 13 years ago, when I was actually much closer to being a teenager, and I mean, I could, I could vaguely remember it at that point, or at least remember something. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that... Um, yeah, it's, it's a complicated thing, especially when modes of communication now are different than they were when, um, when we were kids. That is to say, 
um, you know, you have rituals of communication. If I'm going to make a, an, a, a like, a, if I'm going to set up a, um, a meeting point mm -hmm. with someone now, you know, um, I do it in, in one way, you know, through via the phone or something, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, others would be texting or whatever else. And that is taken for granted mm -hmm. by those who are in that uh, generation, whereas mm -hmm. we have to observe it from above in some ways. Mm -hmm. Usually I am not writing about the, um, the present world, so that's mm -hmm. not a, uh, a problem, but I would actually feel like I would have to observe in a different and more careful way. Um, I remember actually um, for, uh, what was it? Oh, it was when I was writing Feed. Um, someone commented online or something about a previous book I'd written um, called Thirsty, and the, the person said, the characters in this book say like all the time, despite mm -hmm. the fact it doesn't fit in the sentences. Um, that just sounds so 80s, it's like you grew up in the 80s. Like, oh my God, I did grow up in the 80s. <laughs> so what I did was, I decided, well, I need to find out if this is actually um, now passe, if people don't mm -hmm. say like. I thought, I, I do all the time, but maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. So I went um, sauntering up and down Newbury Street in Boston one evening, just sort of letting conversations flow through, mm -hmm. not with a sense of listening to the um, actual data, but just hearing what words people were saying. And I have to tell you, by the end of the evening, I had heard like used so many times in so many irrelevant contexts that if I said the word like in the correct context, it still felt wrong. <laughs> so um, I decided, okay, four John words. Are, are you aware that thirsty now is a slang term for yes. teenagers? Okay, just yeah. checking. Uh, well, just what checking. does it mean? Well, it, it, means, it means someone who's, who's kind of like coming on too strong. That person's really thirsty. Oh, oh I yeah. Coming on right. too strong. Yeah. Or so I'm told by, right. my, by my spot. But how do you do it? I mean, I think that's very, I think yeah. that's very risky. Is your 19-year-old helpful? He, he's, he's quite helpful, and I think he secretly enjoys it. Um, we'll see if he watches this program, um, we'll find out after that. Um, but I also, I'm a big eavesdropper. I'm one of those writers who likes to work in public. I know it's kind of all those obnoxious people that you see with laptops. I'm one of those obnoxious people. And one of the reasons I like it is because of the buzz of conversation. Exactly not the not the data, as you say, mm -hmm. but but kind of the rhythm of it and the the, the shorthand that people use with each other. Mm -hmm. And living in a in a college community, as I do right now, mm. you know, I'm able to just kind of tune into what people younger than me are saying and, and how they're trying to say it. That's one way that I do it. Actually, I was thinking, I mentioned this um, to you earlier, but I think, yeah. uh, so in the, um, in the um, physics book of Deliverance Dane, it's a, part of it is a historical novel set in the 17th and 18th century. Part of it is a historical <laughs> novel set in 1991. <laughs> and um, one of the funny things is that this means yeah. that, for example, I was thinking about this when I was reading it, that um, when a character answers the phone, they can't move around. Because yeah. the phone is attached by this cord yeah. to another part of the phone, and that's yeah. attached to the wall. And it's just so funny because the plot actually, you know, hinges on the fact that you can't make a call from a house with no phone installed. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, um, and you know, there are all sorts of, uh, you know, I mean, the horror movie genre has collapsed because of the cell phone. It's basically. true. But, uh, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's, that's actually a perfect segue into, into my next question, which has to do with, with history to some degree. I mean, Gregory, I've read that you have said that Wicked, your best known work, was to some degree inspired by, you're thinking about Hitler and you're thinking about the nature of evil. And it sounds to me a little bit like thinking about the nature of evil in a somewhat historically inflected sense. I mean, you're working within a pre-built fantasy world, but I feel like there is a history implicit in the Oz stories that you are responding to. And at the same time, Tobin, um, your probably best known book is Astonishing Life of Octavian Nothing. And you are working within an 18th century Boston context. I wonder if you guys could talk some about your relationship to history, to historical research, um, and, and how you work that into your own narrative. Well, you, you, I ran into you once at the, at the Rare Book Room. Oh, you know <laughs> <laughs> I know. It was, it was like, I know, I know. It was not, not it was that, that was the room. But it was just the same. It was so quiet and so private that I felt like I had walked into the shower. <laughs> I mean, you were studying, you were working. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't know you all that well then, but I, I kind of nodded and looked away and I scurried <laughs> out because it was, it was too intimate. You mm, were working mm -hmm. with 18th century texts mm. and I, I, was, I was halfway down the stairs out the Boston Public Library before I caught myself and said, I know Tobit, I could ask him out to lunch. But <laughs> I was too embarrassed at that point. Uh, 
and there's, I mean, I, I really value immensely your capacity to, to get into the 18th century for well, those two you. books. Uh, I, I think of almost nobody, nobody in our generation has done it better in my estimation, oh, well, but that you. shows how little I read. Thank but um, <laughs> it's, um, it really is it's amazing. And I know you go right to um, prime sources. Right. And how do you... How do you take the can opener to get out what you need from those sources, especially for, say, Octavian? Well, nothing. For Octavian, I really, I only, for the, the years that it took to write the two books in that series, um, I really only read 18th century books uh, or books about the 18th century or occasionally things that they would have read in the 18th century from earlier, like the Greeks, the Romans, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So um, by the time I was done, I, it was more natural for me to talk and to write in, in an 18th century voice than a modern one. Mm -hmm. So when um, my girlfriend would call me and I would be up in Maine, you know, writing away, mm -hmm. um, she would say things like, oh my God, you're using too many semicolons. <laughs> stop, <laughs> stop talking in paragraphs. <laughs> <laughs> if it makes you feel any better, I've been trapped in early English, yes. right. English yeah. before, right. you know. Right. For, the 18th, for the 17th right. century, right. you have to worry about those long S's. The long S's you know what are I mean? tough. I love that the long S's. That can really though. suck you they're up. They're beautiful. Yeah. And, and, and there's actually some structures that we've lost. I, being much interested in what you have to say, would like to hear more. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and what, right. About, what about you, Gregory? Because in, to some degree, I think characterizing what you do as historical fiction is not accurate, but knowing that you're responding to a previous literary world is something that I think is interesting to hear about. It, it's, it's, it's analogous, I think. Uh -huh. uh, I have done some of the, uh, I, I went back to the uh, 17th century for Confessions of an Ugly Stepsister, mm -hmm. and, I'm, and the novel I'm just finishing this week is set in the 1860s in England. Mm -hmm. So I've been steeping myself in mm -hmm. 19th century, long 19th century novels, mm -hmm. just for that, you know, just to kind of get the, the lavender and, 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 and you know, the, the yeasty bread <laughs> off the page. Mm -hmm. And that does inflect and, mm -hmm. and, and say something about uh, the prose. Sorry, my nose is drippy. Mm -hmm. uh, but about Oz, it is, it is different because it's taking somebody else's history uh, and getting into it, getting, for when I was writing Wicked, getting into my memory of uh, the many times I'd seen The Wizard of Oz film in 1939, mm -hmm. my memory of the two or three Oz books that I had read as a kid, mm -hmm. and my knowledge of all the ones that existed that I could not find when I was a kid, because mm -hmm. this was before they were all republished in the, in, in the heady, you know, weed-filled days of 1972 <laughs> and 73. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so part of getting into the history of Oz was being aware of everything that wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I was pretty aware of what wasn't there when I finally had my, you know, my blessed vision of, you know, Alphabet coming out of the sky, mm -hmm. you know, with a rosary saying, write about me and all will be well, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that I, I, I thought I can do this because I know nobody said anything about where she came from or why she was the way she was. I knew mm -hmm. they didn't happen in MGM, mm -hmm. and I knew it didn't happen in L. Frank Baum. He was not that kind of a writer. He was, mm -hmm. he was not mythopoeic the way, say, Tolkien was mm -hmm. about Middle Earth or Lewis was about Narnia. Mm -hmm. He didn't care about backstory. He was more related to, in a sense, more related to Lewis Carroll and to Edward Lear. Mm -hmm. uh, the comedy was all on the surface. What, what, uh, what was amusing to see and look and think about now mm -hmm. didn't really have to make sense. It just had to be amusing in the moment, the way a joke does. Mm -hmm. So what that opened up for me was the sense that there's all this history that has not yet been written. Mm -hmm. That, that mm -hmm. must be there if the stories have moral strength. Mm -hmm. They must be there. All I have to do is figure out what it is. Mm -hmm. And since I'm not, I wasn't then uh, a very good researcher, mm -hmm. I think, uh, that gave me the, the cojones, as it were, to march forward into this particular mm -hmm. big, fat writing job, which was much more demanding than anything mm -hmm. I had written in the 16 years previous. Mm -hmm. Because it was fantasy, I, nobody could say, you got this wrong. Right. You know, Hitler didn't have... You know, one el you know, one elbow that was longer than the other. You know, right. uh, that I, I couldn't be faulted for my facts because the mm -hmm. facts were what I could find out in my own subconscious, mm -hmm. and that's why I did it. And I remember, in fact, the uh, first time I read it, um, and remember, in fact, the 
the feeling though of coming to a world that I vaguely knew. I mean, I wasn't a big Oz fan, so I, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I had read the books as a kid and didn't love the ones I read, but, and you know, obviously knew the MGM film well, but I remember the, uh, the shock and fascination of all of those sort of like uh, that, that rippling of details and moral ambiguity um, immediately in the first scene. Uh, it's in Munchkinland, right? Is yes, that the right, first? Yeah, right. uh, the, in, immediately. And uh, it kind of, it's, I thought that it was really wonderful in the way that it jarred the reader out of what they knew about Oz mm -hmm. and forced you almost immediately to kind of reassess it all. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I actually do feel like that is a similarity in something that we, we try to do when we approach, both of, the, of us and we, when we try to approach history or things that pre-exist, is to say, what is it that we tend to, to take for granted about this thing? Mm -hmm. How can I see that in a new light? Right. You know? Right. I like your characterization of that, Tobin, because it's something that I think about when writing historical fiction is the way that these constraints, whether they are constraints of a universe that another author has constructed or mm -hmm. of, a, of a given historical narrative the way we understand it to be, that working to build a new story within those constraints, I at least find it tremendously freeing right. and enabling because I know where the boundaries are. Right. Um, so building on that a little bit, since you also both engage somewhat heavily with the fantastical. You know, can you talk a little bit about how you build a world that contains magic or possibility that is more kind of super, super attenuated than the world we live in today? Can you, can you talk about world building in fiction? Well, one thing that I think, and I'll, I'll say this and pass this to you, but when people call Wicked a fantasy, and it is, of course, a fantasy because Oz is invented, and mm -hmm. there, is, there is some magic, there are magic spells, mm -hmm. but almost nothing important that happens in Wicked happens because of magic. Mm -hmm. Magic is just another, another uh, habit or another talent mm -hmm. that people have, but the talent of thinking about religion and the talent of thinking about moral behavior is just as important as the talent of being able to conjure up a tuna fish sandwich on the banks of a river. Mm -hmm. uh, it, magic is really, it's just that added little something extra to make us relax our guard mm -hmm. so that we won't realize we're getting, I wouldn't say moral instruction, but, mm -hmm. but we're, we're being led uh, uh, on a path over, over a moral bluff, as it were, and, mm -hmm. and being asked to see the landscape. It's really, you know, it's fantastic, but it's not a whole lot of fantasy. Mm -hmm. But it, that's it, actually it, one of the ways I think I like how you change the texture of Baum. So that, I mean, because he does have, as you said, a somewhat, um, there's a somewhat peremptory sense of magic yeah. in his work where if he's bored, he's just going to throw something in. You know what I mean? Yes. And suddenly there, you know, there's something that you then have to, uh, to deal with, but only for 10 pages. Right. You know, right. Um, right. and then it all right. goes away. Whereas I feel like, the, I mean, the, the reason I think that your reimagining that is so powerful is that it is much more integrated. Uh, you know, that, that there's a sense that if, if there are talking animals on one page, there have to be talking animals all the way through, and then there have to be questions about, whoa, 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 what does it mean to have a civilization with talking animals? Yes. Mm -hmm. What do you eat for lunch? Yeah. Right. You know? right, right, right. Well, I, I have to have a little parenthetical here because this is a great lead-in um, for the ways in which authors, and I'm sure you do this too, have to discover their own, you know, their own worlds. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you put out a few things, you put out a few parameters, it's like tinker toys, and you say, well, I think it's going to be this big, and I'm going to get in the middle, and mm -hmm. I'm going to build from the inside out, uh, and I'm going to live in this world that I'm building, this story, whether it be the 18th century or Oz or, mm -hmm. or magic, um, uh, condition one sort or another and then your subconscious this goes back to Sendak who is one of my great muses um, he said I, I just wait for my subconscious to throw me a bone mm -hmm. and I sink the bucket and I see what comes up I was writing Wicked I was well into uh, the second section well not well in the beginning of the second section in first draft and uh, Glinda known as Golinda back then is on the train going to university for the first time and I'm writing a, a scene about how she was glad that the old goat sitting in the seat opposite her was snoring and she didn't have to talk to him and she could look out the window and admire <laughs> herself in the, in the mm -hmm. reflection. She wasn't looking at the landscape that she'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. She was looking about how beautiful she mm -hmm. looked at the reflection <laughs> in the mirror. That's where I stopped that day and I went and I had dinner. And the next morning I got up to read a paragraph to, to just kind of stitch myself back into the tone and the, and the scene. And I got to that phrase, the old goat. And I suddenly realized, oh my gosh, 
that's a goat. <laughs> that's a real goat mm -hmm. in that cabin with her. I didn't yes. notice yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday I thought it was oh, an old man. Sweet. But to now I realize, oh, there's going to be talking animals in this story. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. And because I even didn't though, know... Even because of the lion, you didn't know that? No, that I didn't. I, I, I hadn't gotten there yet. Uh, I didn't know. Maybe the lion was talking because somebody had created a spell. Who ah. knows? But I didn't know until the goat woke up and started to talk mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that there were going to be talking animals. That was going to be an important part. And what I didn't do was go back and put talking animals in the first 95 pages because I wanted it to come upon the reader mm -hmm. with the same sense of surprise. Mm -hmm. it, would, mm -hmm. it would illustrate just how limited the life was that Alphaba had come right. from. Right. That, right. that she didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And you know the, the readers don't know that because I didn't know it. So mm -hmm. that's the way in which you're inside the constructs. You know, you've mm -hmm. set out your parameters. Mm -hmm. You said these are the Cartesian coordinates of where I'm going to live right now, but they still surprise you, and it still brings up well magic. I hate to say, but mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So I I don't think I have veered off. Topic. <laughs> no, so not at all. I tend to do that. Not but, at uh, all. Um, Tobin, can you tell us a little bit about your own world building also because you, you, you write stories that are set in historical periods that some of us might feel that we know pretty mm -hmm. well, but then, then you kind of elaborate on them in such a wonderful mystical way. Do you think you could Well, I mean, in, uh, in the Octavian Nothing books, that's, it, there's no fantasy in there in the sense that everything is called from, I mean, uh, even though there are these bizarre mm -hmm. scientists, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the book is, uh, they're about a, a kid who discovers that he is the subject of an enlightenment, a kind of crazed enlightenment experiment, and that he's yeah. always been a subject yeah. of a crazed enlightenment experiment. And so the, the experiments that are being carried on are in fact, as loopy as they sound, are actually in, in almost all cases real experiments. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the things I was probably looking through when you came across me in the, um, in the sweaty halls of the Athenaeum <laughs> was, um, was uh, I was looking, I was reading a lot of the uh, proceedings of the um, American Philosophical Society wow. to read sort of what, you know, the scientific papers from that period and to, to call interesting experiments that I could then replicate in the book. So oh. anyway, um, mm -hmm. So all of that is actually... So I'm giving you too much credit is what you're saying. For, exactly. For invention. Right. It really was, I mean, the idea is sort of of constructing a thing. But once again, I mean, very much like we're talking about with um, the re-imagining um, of Oz. Mm -hmm. I mean, I clearly have a sense of Boston in the 1770s because, you know, my Lord, back in the, um, I was alive during the bicentennial and yeah. everyone went crazy in your hometown, Concord, and, uh, you know, it was all, um, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, so mm -hmm. I remember very firmly what that was like in a, in a, and what the myths were, and I, by myths I don't necessarily mean things that weren't true, but I just mm -hmm. mean the, the central stories we were telling about ourselves mm -hmm. then and then also later, and I decided, well, I'm going to put something together that has a very different feel to it but that has a feel that is still legitimately 18th century mm -hmm. because I wanted to kind of recapture the moment of not knowing mm -hmm. in the revolution, for mm -hmm. example. The moment where no one knew that it made sense to uh, separate from the mother country when you know it wasn't the redcoats are coming, it was the regulars are coming, meaning right. the army is coming. Right. Um, your own army, it would be like if we you know, fought our own right. army. Um, and uh, and it's, it's a much more terrifying doubtful prospect than we give them uh, credit for. And that mm -hmm. also means that the heroism in some ways is greater mm -hmm. if there is doubt that's there as well. So I wanted to recapture that. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question. Do you mind if I no, pose a question in? to both of you? Because mm -hmm. this is sort of, uh, first I want to say when I first read Octavian mm -hmm. Nothing, the just like the beginning of Wicked, the first 70 pages of it, I thought it was a fantasy. Right. And, mm -hmm. and you led me there mm -hmm. and, you, and I was, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, I was amazed and delighted to wake up at about page 72 mm -hmm. and realize, oh my gosh, this is not a fantasy. This, mm -hmm. is, this is an historic novel. Mm -hmm. Wow. And my question for both of you is whether you have analogic experiences to my story of reading your own prose and realizing that there are clues in your prose of what you've written that, that refine what your mission actually is. Because that happens to me fairly often. I wonder whether mm -hmm. it's a common whether it's a common experience. And Julie, I'm curious about you, too. But. Hmm. I, uh, I mean, yes, but not in as interesting a way as with you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would have there to are times when I realize, oh, I, I want this character to be, um, to be sharp and angrier than they are, or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, that kind of uh -huh. thing. 
But um, I don't know. Do you have a better answer than me? Well, I, I think maybe I've had characters surprise me in ways that I didn't anticipate, uh -huh. which is I've heard other authors describe that experience. And I've also been surprised to discover that I'm not necessarily always in control of what will happen. Uh -huh. mm. So, for instance, in, in Physic Book, there's a character who dies at the end who, in my initial conception of the book, did not die in the end. And in mm. fact, if you, if you, I wrote that book in order. And if you go back and read, there's a moment where I deliberately leave ambiguous that character's outcome, that character's date of death. And it's because I'm setting it up for, for that mm. character to, to not meet the end that she meets. And it was only when I was about two thirds of the way through the book when I realized that that was absolutely wrong for the story. It was, it was right for the, some of the historical bases I was working with, but it was totally wrong for the character. It was totally wrong for the story. It was totally wrong for the overarching themes of the book and mm -hmm. those themes having to do with gender and witchcraft and, and class tensions, frankly. Mm -hmm. And that uh, and that and that I had to kill this person. And I actually, mm -hmm. the, the day that I figured out I had to kill this character, I was really upset. I really, I cried, which sounds Aww. terrible, but I actually was very. And I had to email a friend who's also a novelist. And I was like, I'm so depressed. I have to kill her. I can't believe I have yeah. to kill. Her. Why am I not in charge? You know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, why are you both uh, look? You both have this witchcraft thing going on. What's the story? I didn't, you know. I, I know. Yeah. It's, well, I know. and it's funny too because I feel like we, we have rather different kinds of witchcraft going on to some degree. Um, how, did, how, did witchcraft, how did you come to witchcraft, Greg? Well, I, I had, um, uh, well, you know, I've been asked this question a lot recently, not just because of Wicked and, and Broadway and an mm -hmm. eventual movie, I understand, uh, but because <laughs> of. so casual. Well, We're you out. know, they've been saying this for 10 years. You know, so. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm not holding my breath. But um, 10 years before I wrote Wicked, I published my fourth children's book, and it was the first one that was an attempt at a fairy tale rather than what you might call a domestic fantasy like Charlotte's mm -hmm. Web, where the mm -hmm. magic stuff happens in the real world. We can all get in the car and drive up to Brooklyn, Maine, and see whether we can find you know, Wilbur the pig and Charlotte. Well, Charlotte's dead, but Wilbur might see um, <laughs> Spoiler, but, yeah. spoiler. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Trigger, trigger. <laughs> uh, but, um, but 10 years before Wicked, I, my fourth book was called The Dream Stealer, and it was set in a, a Russian milieu, the Russian uh, milieu of fairy tales as illustrated by Bilibin, uh, mm. you know, with Sars and, and swans and, and Baba Yaga the witch. Mm -hmm. And now I look back on that book and I think, that was kind of a trial run for Wicked 10 years earlier. Interesting. Um, because the character of Baba Yaga in the stories, if you go collect the Russian uh, fairy tales by Afanasyev, collected by Afanasyev, you can see sometimes Baba Yaga in a story, she, you know, she's an Ur character, sometimes she is the helpful old woman, you know, who needs her sticks carried on the road, and to the third son she will tell how he can find the casket with the key that will unlock the door to the princess's, you know, medicine cabinet or whatever it is that he needs. And, uh, or other times, she's the fierce Hansel and Gretel like witch who's going to kill the children if, mm -hmm. uh, if she's hungry. So the fact that in the original stories she can play either part depending on mm -hmm. what this fairy tale needs mm -hmm. it just struck me as, wow, she's, an, she's more interesting than most people in fairy tales because she's She's emotionally, she's morally ambiguous. Mm -hmm. She has capacity. Mm -hmm. She has human capacity mm -hmm. to do right and to do wrong. And so the Dream Stealer is about Baba Yaga, who is a witch in the woods with um, a house standing on chicken legs. Mm -hmm. But she also understands the, the needs of community. And mm -hmm. when the little village is threatened, she kind of throws her her weight in with them. Mm -hmm. But she never, you know, she never sings and dances, you know, and she's still a witch. Mm -hmm. yeah. But she's part of the community. Mm -hmm. Does um, she sing and dance in here? Because she, oh, she reappears in his new novel. Yes, novel. she does. She does. Would you like to hear a song? Yes. Are you kidding? Yeah, of course. Yeah. This is a song she sings. Thank you for that lead in. You that was a great lead in. Uh, and, and then we'll go back to the, about witches. But um, this, Baba Yaga uh, reappears again 31 years later after, um, after the Dream Stealer. Egg and Spoon is set in the same village, but mm -hmm. it's about two generations later. It's set in about 1907. And now I am more aware of my debt to T.H. White, the once and future king. Mm -hmm. And so the Baba Yaka character in this book, like T.H. White, it kind of lives in a breezy way in relation to chronology and to, and to culture. She knows things 
about the world that mm -hmm. people in 1907 don't know. For instance, when uh, uh, a human child comes to her door and is starving, she, she says, well, I'll, 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 I'll conjure you up a roast porcupine. And the girl says, I'm a vegetarian. And uh, she says, well, in that case, I'll make some blintzes. And the girl says, well, I, you know, I have a gluten allergy or something. <laughs> and, and Baba Yaga says, oh, what the hell, just have Cheerios. And, uh, and so she, you know, she, she laces contemporary. This is as contemporary as I, I get, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of, you know, investigating 19-year-olds and saying, what do they know about? I'm talking about <laughs> witches serving Cheerios in 1907. Mm -hmm. But she, uh, when, when the witch falls asleep, the girl examines um, her, her hut and she sees evidence of magic and she sees evidence of, of animal experimentation and, you know, rat skeletons and things like this. And she comes across a bunch of original cast recordings um, for things like cats <laughs> and, and, and Phantom of the Opera. Um, um, she must not have liked Wicked because I didn't name it. Um, but later on, they get, they, get to, um, they get to St. Petersburg and the witch is in disguise as the girl's governess. Her name is Miss Yaga. And uh, they're trying to break into a great party at the Winter Palace. Um, and they're in disguise, and they're having trouble breaking in, and they're all getting very nervous, and, and they start talking about peasants, and maybe they'd be better disguised as peasants, because nobody looks at peasants. And the, the girl says something to Baba Yaga about, well, you know, tell me about peasants. And Baba Yaga's nervous too. When she's nervous, she sings, like me. And this is what she sings. Sunrise, sunset, <laughs> unwise, upset, peasants, have to sing. <laughs> Nothing so bad it isn't funny. Nothing so good it doesn't sting. Oi! <laughs> Sunrise, sunset, upright, <laughs> not yet. Peasants sing away. Justice is scheduled tomorrow. Business as usual today. <laughs> she does that more than once, but that's as far as I'll say. The truth is, then we'll, go, then we'll go to you on witches. The truth is, and I, I made this as a joke, but as soon as I said it, I thought, no, there's some truth here. I was taught by nuns, and I mm. was taught by very good nuns. None of them were malicious. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Philomena. It wasn't any of those Madeline sisters. They were all... Very smart, very sharp, very intelligent, caring women with a great and profound moral compass that you could never understand. <laughs> and they dressed in black. And they were all powerful because they owed nothing to anyone. Mm -hmm. They stood apart and lived apart from the community, but they had the most immense power of anybody in the community. And I think, really, once I, once I made the joke about nuns, I thought, that's where it comes from, mm -hmm. this admiration for these powerful, independent, selfless women. Well, so how about you? Well, actually what I'd like to do, if we can, we can table witches a little bit, okay. we could go back to it with, with, if our audience would okay. like to hear Sorry. more. But given that we're on Egg and Spoon, I would like to hear a little more about Egg and Spoon and also the fact that, Tobin, your next book is also set in Russia. And so it I'd is. like to hear some, some details on the movement into a new realm, into a new history, into a new sort of context. Yeah. Let's talk Russia. So, um, yeah, so my uh, next book is going to be a nonfiction book um, on um, the composer Dmitry Shostakovich and the mm -hmm. siege of Leningrad. So the basic uh, story, um, which is real, is that, you know, Leningrad was surrounded by the Germans during World War II, longest siege in recorded history, several years long, people starving to death, people eating each other. It was a really, really horrific, horrific period. And for the beginning of it, Shostakovich was stuck there and was actually writing a symphony that um, in some ways mirrored his experiences in the city. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's argument about how much, but how much it mirrors that and how much it was a commentary on Stalin, that kind of thing. Anyway, the point is, this was used, this symphony then, the um, Leningrad Symphony, was used as a kind of a propaganda tool by the government to interest the Americans in the Russian cause. Mm -hmm. So it was put onto microfilm and smuggled out through the Middle East and flown to South America and then up uh, to, um, to New York, where it was then uh, you know, performed as a way of convincing the Americans that despite the fact that only a few months before, the Russians had been um, our, uh, you know, at least um, 
we'd been very suspicious of them. No, no, they were really just people just like us. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, at the same time, the score was also performed in Leningrad itself by this kind of uh, you know, collection of musicians, all of whom were ragged, soot-covered. They collapsed from exhaustion and starvation during the um, rehearsals. It was an incredible moment in sort of the showing human will. And they performed the piece in the city. Actually, the, the army bombed the far side, the Germans on the far side of the city as a way of drawing fire away from the concert hall uh, during the concert. And um, they broadcast the thing throughout the streets and across no man's land towards the Germans. And we actually have uh, eyewitness testimony from Germans who heard this and who said, you know, the night that we heard the Leningrad Symphony was the night we knew we would never take Leningrad. Wow. So it's, um, it's about sort of the power of, of music to actually alter the course of, of things that are much more solid, like, um, you know, pans or tanks. That's incredible. That sounds so, Well, I hope it will be. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, I've heard you talk about it before, and it sounds like the most amazing. I thought you were writing us a novel. I no, no, it's, a non, it's totally a nonfiction book. There's actually yeah. enough, given the period, there's enough yeah. uh, material that, you know, yeah. I can go without making anything wow. else. Wow. So. Yeah. Well, I have one last question to get us into our question and answer period, if, if I may, and that is, you both have been writing for a long time. Um, I'm curious to hear what is your favorite crazy question that you've ever gotten from a reader? Engaging with readers is one of my favorite parts of my job, and because I write about witches, I get some pretty good ones. And so I was curious to hear, uh -huh. I was curious to hear what is your favorite, most far out question you've ever gotten from a reader, and then we can go into a broader discussion. Well, you know, this is not, fa this is not favored or far out, but mm -hmm. since, as, as I've given away, I'm, I'm Catholic, you know, I, I have the, this impulse toward the confessional. And so this <laughs> I is, think we all enjoy that. This is not a, this is not How a How long since your last confession? <laughs> <laughs> Where's the mic? <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was not a profoundly happy moment for me. This was, this was a moment where I, I felt I failed a young person. Mm -hmm. And I, I hardly ever felt I did that. I thought mm. I was really able to walk up to the square of whatever question was being asked and answer it. And if, if I thought it was a question that the, a person really needed to have answered in a certain way, I would answer it deviously, but answer it in such a way that, mm -hmm. that I could communicate. Mm -hmm. Now, in my many years of working with kids, because I did that before Wicked, I made most of my income uh, teaching and speaking, uh, almost always boys would ask the question, um, how much do you make? <laughs> mm. And girls would ask the question, are you married? Mm -hmm. And then one time, uh, a sixth grade boy asked the question, are you married? And I couldn't answer him. I, I said, that's private. Hmm. And I was ashamed of myself the minute I said it, because it wasn't private. I wasn't married, I had a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to say that in that school to that boy. Partly, I think, I was maybe a little bit afraid that it would hurt him. Mm -hmm. But I also was just, it was a moment of cowardice. Mm -hmm. And I have not had met that many of them, mm -hmm. and not in public. And so that's, you know, that's, that's not what the question you were answering. But, mm -hmm. but that was a question that I couldn't, mm -hmm. I couldn't answer at that particular moment mm -hmm. in that particular milieu, and mm -hmm. I was ashamed of myself. Please forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about, but, you, know, that, I, you know, that didn't answer it, your question. The but. thing is that, No, you know, it, it did, because in a way what I wanted to know was sort of what is a particularly memorable encounter yeah. that you've yeah. had with a reader that was important to you? Yeah. And, and I think that that's kind of a, a beautiful one to yeah. think about. Well, I, it, taught, it taught myself to be braver, but... Yeah. Um, uh, you know, the thing is that going into schools with kids, you invariably get more uh, interesting, um, sometimes even insane questions <laughs> than you do when reading uh, to adults. I mean, so I've had, you know, um, are there books written for horses? Um, I talked about clever. I talked about clever Hans. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, but um, but I guess the um the closest to the kind of thing you're talking about, I guess, is um, I was explaining to some kids who actually, you know, um. I wrote, a, for my sins, a vampire novel, which unfortunately missed the vampire boat by about 10 years. <laughs> were you, were you ahead 
or behind? I was ahead, but that oh, doesn't help. Man. That still doesn't help. So anyway, Burn. in around uh, what, like 1995 or something, it came out, 96. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Anyway, the point is, <laughs> so um, I was in a, a, a classroom where the kids were actually, in my opinion, too young to be reading that particular book. <laughs> anyway, they were about fourth grade or so, and they, but they all wanted to know about this vampire thing because it had taken off by this point. Um, and so I said, well, you know, it's a, uh, it's a book about a kid who, um, has, who's turning into a vampire and he's, he has to decide, you know, um, is he going to become a vampire or is he going to, um, I mean, is he going to, be, to remain human or is he going to, to suck human blood? And I said sort of sarcastically, I mean, that's a very difficult decision for all of us. And this, <laughs> little, um, this little boy sitting right in the front row suddenly whispers, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what? did anyone else hear that? Because yeah. there's someone who's going to have a really awkward sleepover this weekend. Well, as we get toward the question uh, period now, I, 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 remind, oh, no. I remind you of a couple of, you know, when I'd say, you know, uh, does any, you know, maybe some second graders or, you know, whoever it was, does anybody have any questions about writing? And one kid will inevitably raise their hand and say, how do you make an R? <laughs> <laughs> or, or so one, hard. A F cursive uh -huh. Q. Yeah, I still yes, can't really. do it. Or, or, or <laughs> I was talking about the story development. And I said, we have, we have this. We have rising action. Then we have something called a crisis. Does anybody know what a crisis is? <laughs> and one kid said, yes, it's when things get so bad, you have to say, Christ! That's good. Yeah, Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, that's mine. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, so uh, a, a mutual writer friend of ours, Tim Wynn Jones, tells the story of talking to um, some first graders, and inevitably you're asked the question, where do you get your ideas? And he'd had a slightly long day, so he said, oh, I get them at the idea store. <laughs> but then this little kid raises his hand and goes, oh, I've been there. <laughs> and Tim said, oh, really? Yeah. And what's it like? But this is kind of amazing. The kid goes, oh, well, all the things that are like other, like the other things are all together. So all the things that are about cooking are in one place and all the things that are about <gasps> sleeping are in another place. Was he talking and about Tim Michaels? Said, <laughs> no, no, Tim said, wait, did you mean the, the idea store or the Ikea store? <laughs> Is it gold and blue? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> wonderful. Oh, that is great. That is great. Or oh, then there's the other one where, where I, I asked, you know, does anybody have any questions for me? And a little girl raised me and said, do you know I have a cat? <laughs> <laughs> what, what better comment to end on and to, and to open the floor if there are any uh, questions or remarks from, from people in the audience? Yes. First of all, well, we um, need to use the, really okay use the microphone. Oh. Yes, approach, yeah, approach actually, the microphone. What I was just going to ask is, would you read a little bit from Octavian Nothing? Okay. Just a little bit. <laughs> 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 to hear the language. Yeah. I'll just read the uh, the first uh, page. Um, so this is uh, the beginning of Octavian Nothing, Traitor to the Nation, Volume One, The Fox Party. <laughs> I was raised in a gaunt house with a garden. My earliest recollections are of floating lights in the apple trees. I recall in the orchard behind the house orbs of flame rising through the black boughs and branches. They climbed spiritous and flickered out. My mother squeezed my hand with delight. We stood near the door to the ice chamber. By the well, servants lit bubbles of gas on fire, clad in frock coats of asbestos. Around the orchard and gardens stood a wall of some height, designed to repel the glance of idle curiosity and to keep us all from slipping away and running for freedom, though that, of course, I did not yet understand. How doth all that seeks to rise burn itself to nothing? I did have one question that I didn't manage to work in, if I may throw it into our general question moment, and it builds on something you said earlier, Gregory. Uh, you were using the phrase, um, moral, you, you said moral ambiguity a lot, or talked a lot about kind of the moral qualities of, of witches or within the story, and I think that the question of morality runs very strongly through your work as well, Tobin, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you both give some thought maybe to either the politics of the fiction that you're writing or to, do you have a kind of 
moral purpose behind what you're trying to produce? Or is it sort of more incidental to telling a good story? My work is almost always predicated on a moral question. It's right. not, it's, I don't have a moral intention. That is, I don't have an intention necessarily to persuade anybody to think mm -hmm. uh, the way that I think. But I do have an intention to persuade people to ask themselves the questions that also interest me. Mm -hmm. And I, I imagine that, that perhaps I'm giving some, some possible answers to my questions. Mm -hmm. But it's one of the reasons I write my books, too, because mm -hmm. I have... I have moral questions for myself, and the mm -hmm. only way I can stumble upon the answers is to, is to write about them. Mm -hmm. I mean, for instance, in, in Wicked, the reason I wrote it was because there had been a terrible murder of a two-year-old boy by an 11-year-old and a 14-year-old mm -hmm. uh, boy and uh, who were playing hooky one day. They found a boy who'd wandered away from his mother. By the end of the day, they'd become murderers. Wow. And so the moral mm -hmm. question is, how do we recognize the capacity for evil within ourselves and what do we do if we recognize it in others? Mm -hmm. And what do we do with the fact that we can name such a thing and call it out the way they did in Salem, right. whether or not it's true? I mean, those are, mm -hmm. that, that is not a, a prescription for correct behavior. Mm -hmm. Those are just questions that we have to ask ourselves basically every day of our lives mm -hmm. if we are to live responsibly you know, in, mm -hmm. in a community. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how that's what it is to me. It's not mm -hmm. to make everybody vote Democratic you know, <laughs> or anything else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I would say a similar thing. I mean, I feel that all fiction has a political dimension in that it's all written in a particular world by a particular person, right. you know. Um, but um, I do think that the and, and the moral element definitely is in some ways a um, a production of the politics and vice versa. I mean, I think mm -hmm. politics are. are a question of morality as well. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that, um, that well, um, like Gregory, I think that I do, uh, I'm interested in morally difficult moments. And part of it is not, once again, not to, to say this is what uh, a reader should do. Mm -hmm. This is what I want to try to convince you of. Because I think I'd write a nonfiction essay if I wanted to convince someone. Right. But rather, I think that moral anxiety propels a story and propels the more interesting stories. Mm -hmm. Stories that are not propelled by moral anxiety mm -hmm. are ones where, uh, tend to be ones where people are either wrong or right. Mm -hmm. And that's less interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so in the case of the Shostakovich book, you know, uh, as a very minor example, you know, the Shostakovich family had to eat their dog. And I, you say to yourself, what would I do confronted with that situation? I mean, I have dogs that I, because as we discussed earlier, I don't have children, mm -hmm. I creepily treat like children. <laughs> um, I do that too. You do that too? Okay, yeah. And you see what I mean? Like, I treat my children like dogs. Like dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so that confronting that and saying, what does that actually mean? What would I do in that situation? What would I do knowing what I know about that situation? You know, that is, a, it makes me tremendously anxious, but frankly, anxiety is what drives um, interest, I think, in writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you have a question, and you, sir, have a question in front? Would you like to go to the, the microphone? Oh. I remember reading A.O. Scott in the New York Times. He came up with a list of the great 25 greatest novels or something of the last 50 years. And there was a, a line in there where he said, what we seem to want from our great novels is to attach private destinies to public events. And hmm. he mentioned many books, including Don DeLillo's Underworld, mm -hmm. um, that does just that. And in listening to the two of you talk about your books, it seems in a sense, you've done that too, a great symphony, a beloved um, story. I wonder mm -hmm. if in piggybacking these stories or in attaching yourself to these stories, it's also quite nerve-wracking because there are people who care a great deal about The Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. And it takes almost you know, chutzpah to do that. <laughs> and I wondered if the bar is raised very high, if you're nervous approaching these touchstones, what that was like for you. That's a great question, um, and I'm going to duck it. Uh, you must, you must have had like crazy Oz fans. Oh, I, oh, I did. I had, who, I had who, people. I had one woman come uh, in one of my first readings. I was in the Midwest, and she came with dark sunglasses. She was about eight feet tall, and she had stilettos, which I was sure had knives, stiletto heels. <laughs> you know, stiletto knives inside the stiletto heels, and and uh, a fedora. 
and she had a snap brim sort of jacket that came up around her ears <laughs> and she came and she said I have a confession to make and um, I said yes and she said I'm from the International Wizard of Oz Come uh, uh, Club and, I, and I'm here as a delegate and I came to spy on you and report back about your sedition and <laughs> I've become a convert, and she threw her hat and her glasses. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, I, I'll now tell you just a, just a scrap about the book that I'm finishing right now. Mm -hmm. um, the Wizard of Oz, I guess I did have trepidation about that because it is the story, not so much the book, but the story as a myth, has become one of the foundation myths of 20th century American culture. Mm -hmm. uh, it's how we understand ourselves in many ways. Uh, it's just as important to our self-understanding as um, you know Thomas Paine or mm -hmm. or Henry David Thoreau and, or, or Emerson. I, I sincerely believe. Uh, but Wizard of Oz as a book has some bumps and lumps and holes in it. So it had it was porous enough for me to be able to snaggle my grappling hooks in mm -hmm. and think I can fill in some of these holes without really interrupting or abrading the original story. Right after it came out and it was a surprise success, my then editor called and said, now I want you to do Alice. And I said, Judith, <laughs> The Wizard of Oz is a, is, a, is a nice story, but one of the reasons I could write it is because there are things about the movie that are not answered. And there, mm -hmm. are, there are points that are not revealed and reviewed, and so it gave me purchase. Alice in Wonderland is a work of genius in the English language, mm -hmm. and I don't have the chutzpah. Mm -hmm. um, and so forget about it. Well, 19 years later, I've learned two things. One, I do have the chutzpah. <laughs> and two, nobody really pays attention to what I do anyway. So why not? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not, not going to have a cover page article in the New York Review of Books ever. Mm -hmm. And so who cares? <laughs> I'm not, I'm also, I also don't have the capacity to do any damage to Alice in Wonderland, no matter mm -hmm. what I did, whether mm -hmm. I, if I made her a prostitute. Mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't. She, she's, a, she's immortal. She's eternal, and I have a, a much lower sense of my ability to interrupt a great work of art, and therefore I feel more freedom about it. So my next book is called After Alice. It will come mm -hmm. out next year, and it will be published 150 years after the original Alice, mm -hmm. and it's about Alice's sister left on the riverbank when Alice disappears. Mm -hmm. Wow, very cool. Mm -hmm. so. Very cool. You still have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, the, the question. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, I mean, I, I have had, um, you know, like uh, American Revolution people um, write to me and things. But by and large, um, they, uh, the, I mean, the, the biggest group of them who have written to me have been um, Redcoat reenactors who <laughs> thank me for the fact that the book is actually um, somewhat more uh, sympathetic to the uh, loyalist plight. Than, um, than normal. And so just because, especially for the people who do slog out into fields dressed in <laughs> woolen <laughs> waistcoats, you know, every weekend of the, I think it gets pretty demoralizing having people yell, you know, Limey, go home all the time. <laughs> so, um, so they actually are quite pleased that someone finally would yeah. suggest that there might have been a good reason to be a, a loyalist. Um, so. Yeah. It's a favorite Saturday morning occupation for our kids yeah. <laughs> to go over to the old North Bridge oh, and, right. and, and, and abuse right. the heckle the, heckle the red coats. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question, Haley. Should I go over there? Please. Please. Mm -hmm. Well, I started thinking about this when Gregory said that a child asked him, was he married? Mm -hmm. And he couldn't bring himself to answer that. It's not about the experience of being writer in relation to speaking to audiences, but to your work. And that is, to what extent has your own sexuality, your own either attraction to people of the same sex or the opposite sex, affect how you write and what, you're, what you are writing? You're, it, uh, and, and and especially as you enter into an imaginary world in which you can proceed in any number of directions, but your own life and experience obviously is there to play a role in what you imagine. Well, I'll, I'll answer that one first. Um, and, and that is really not so much, 
that I can that I can easily see that my own sexuality, my own being gay, and in, in, in the in the era in which I discovered myself to be gay, has so much affected what I wrote as that it affected that I wrote, hmm. and that I think I began to write, you know, early on, but by the age of about six, in part to figure out where I was because. I, I didn't, I could feel by the age of six that I was not like my four brothers. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that meant I was smarter, but in fact, <laughs> in fact I knew my brothers were smarter, mm -hmm. you know? And so I, I just kept <laughs> writing really to find out who I was. I didn't, have a, I didn't have a name for it back then, but I look back now and I kept most of my manuscripts. I can clearly see that I was struggling I was struggling, I, all my characters, for instance, you know, up until, uh, well, you know, up until my 20s or 30s were, were heterosexual, married, you know, the, 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 it was the marriage plot. All, this, all my mm. stories in you know, childhood ended with men and women getting married. And I thought, well, that's the, that's the proper place for the story to end because that's death to a story. And, <laughs> and, and, uh, and I, you know, that was always, you know, nothing, nothing more has happened in there. You know? so, um, so I, you know, as I've gotten older, of course, I do think that uh, the, it, it is part of the job of any artist to to stand on the margins as much as possible in order to get as synoptic a panoramic view mm. uh, as possible. It, you know, your your sexuality is a, uh, especially if if you're in a minority, your sexuality is a tool in that. But I don't think it's a. I don't think it's necessarily a, a trip to being an artist. I just think it's a tool if you are an artist. That's 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 my theory. But I don't I don't know um, any more than that. Certainly helped me write about a green skinned witch. And be, mm. you know, people are always saying, "Why do you write so well about women? Why are you so often women your main characters?" And I say, "Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but women are more interesting." <laughs> <laughs> don't tell anybody I said so, but and, you know. They, they, they think in more complicated ways and they can tolerate ambu ambiguities mm. even at a dinner table conversation. They, can, they don't have to weigh in and conclude in every sentence. <laughs> they can, they can, mansplaining. They can, they can hold, yeah, right. They can Wait hold a second, this, is, this has been a mansplaining <laughs> episode, though. I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> I'm not answering the question now. I'm going to be ambiguous. <laughs> Um, and I mean, I feel like um, my, my, my books tend not to be very uh, lovey, but um, they, I think that they... Um, can, you, can you say lovey again, just like that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. Anyway, so, um, but I do think that there is a, I mean, there clearly is a, uh, a sense in my work of, um, of sort of frustrated uh, desire quite a lot. Um, you know, uh, there, there's a very typical kind of recurring thing of, you know, a, a boy who is in love with a girl who doesn't like him and that kind of thing. Um, and that might have something to do, you know, with my setup. Mm -hmm. How about Am you? I supposed to answer that one? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, and well, God, that's, 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 that's an interesting question. And I'd have to say that um, most of my characters are overly brainy women who fall in love kind of incidentally while they're trying to accomplish an intellectual task. Mm -hmm. And that's so far true in all three of the books that I have written. And so I, I was hoping you were going to say that's so far true in all three of my marriages. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's where she was going. Yeah, yeah. But talking, about, talking about the role of, of, of you know, sexuality and my role as an author, I have to say I mainly experience it as being cheated out of having groupies. I mean, I feel like you know, huh. young, attractive male authors get groupies, and I, hmm. I don't. <laughs> I'm sorry. Tobin. <laughs> we'll be your groupies. <laughs> well, <yeah. Thanks. laughs> I, I, have a, uh, I have a story to tell, though, and this is actually this comes from the, the question of groupies. I don't, I don't have groupies, but every once in a while, uh, one of the places where I, where I get the biggest crowds of, of any place I've spoken in the nation is a certain gay bookstore in Atlanta. Why? I don't know. I've been to other gay bookstores, so, you know, but this Atlanta. And one time I was, I was, I think, signing for Out of Oz, and there were 220 men in a room about this size, 
except it was also filled with bookshelves. Mm. So I had to be up like I'd stand on a chair so people could see me over the, you know, the edges of the six foot bookcases. And there was one kid, he was a kid, I mean, he was about 18 or 16 or something, who had come dressed in green skin paint. <laughs> and, uh, and I, you know, I, I, said, I said something, I tried to say something amusing about him in the course of my remarks, but he stood around and he stood around, he stood around, he stood around, and it took a long time to sign all the books, but he was the second or la the second last or last person. And then I said, you know, as I, I say to everybody, like, where did you come from? And he said, oh, I live, you know, two and a half hours away. And I said, and you, did you come all the way for this? And he, you know, pointed to his green face. I, said, <laughs> I guess you did. Uh, and, and then I said, I said, uh, I can't believe it. I said, I said, are you in high school? And he said, yes. And I said, well, you know, I, I hope you have a safe place to stay tonight. And he said, no, I'm going home tonight. I said, you came two and a half hours just to this bookstore to get a signed book and you're going two and a half hours home on the same night? I said, that's, I, I'm really flattered. And he almost started to cry and he said, well, he said, here's what happened. I was, I borrowed you know, my parents wouldn't let me go. They went, my parents wouldn't let me come. And I borrowed my friend's car. And I left town. Uh, and an hour outside of town, car broke down. Oh, no. Mm. And he was all painted in green, you know, mm. in Georgia, in the country. Oh. And he said, I said, well, you got, you know, you're all right. You got here. What happened? And he said... I called my dad. His dad, who wouldn't give him permission to come, came in the pickup truck, picked him up at the side of the road, and drove him the rest of the way. Mm. And was oh. waiting outside mm. to drive him home. Oh. And so I don't know whether that counts as a groupie story, but that's one of like the best, that's the best stories. You know, I I, I wrote a note to his dad. That's wonderful. Uh, I signed his book and then I wrote a letter to his mm. dad and I said, "Give that to your dad. Yeah. You are a good dad." Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Took care of his son. Are there any other questions from, from you guys? So um, we heard uh, Tobin talk about taking on the story, our custom stories about the American Revolution in Octavian Nothing. And, and Gregory, you took on a lot of sort of accepted, iconic storytelling in The Wizard of Oz, but I would love to hear you talk, uh, Catherine, about writing the Physic Book of Deliverance Dane, which also, at its heart, mm -hmm. has a story about America that we all have a very firm idea about, but probably, in fact, know nothing about, which is the Salem Witch Trials. Can you talk about how you came to write sure. that book? Absolutely. Uh, Physic Book of Deliverance Dane came about to large part because I was living in New England. I was living in Marblehead, which is, which is right close to Salem. And uh, it also has one of the, I don't know if this is that widely known, it has one of the largest collections of 18th century houses in the whole country. I mean, I think Colonial Williamsburg has a few more. Um, but Marblehead Actually, is... it has more houses built before 1775. Oh, is that it, more houses <laughs> built before 1775? That's, wow. that's a great statistic to know. So Marblehead, and, and I have to tell you, I'm from Houston, Texas originally, and so the landscape that I'm accustomed to seeing is just very different. I mean, I'd been, I'd been in historic houses and things like that, but I'd never been in such a continually mm. occupied space before. It was really very evocative for me. And I was in graduate school studying, um, studying American studies at the time. And I was very struck by the fact that in Salem today, you know, we have this picture of witches, which is, which is I think, very consistent with the kinds of witches that you tell stories about, with pointy hats and yeah. able to fly and, you know, very in influenced by, um, by folklore and by popular <coughs> culture, uh, which is fantastic. And at the same time, I thought it was very interesting to be living in a part of the world where for generation upon generation upon generation, we believed witches were actually real, like mm -hmm. real enough that we had to legislate against them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the fact that it was against the law to practice witchcraft is actually kind of a profound point. It sounds obvious, but it's actually profound because we don't legislate against something that isn't real. 
And I also knew that the... And that's why we don't legislate against global warming. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. Sorry, go ahead. Not at all. And so, and so I, I was so, part of me was interested in, in the relationship between this, you know, how did we go from the historical fact of witches to the, the folkloric phenomenon of witches? And also I was interested by the fact that we have experienced Salem to such a degree through fiction. I mean, I think most of us encounter the story of Salem first by reading The Crucible when we were in high school, mm -hmm. and, uh, which is a fantastic play, I hasten to add, and beautifully researched. Um, but many of the time that I've taught uh, history classes on witchcraft and have tried to teach The Crucible and had students mistake it for a, a historical document mm -hmm. about what mm -hmm. really happened. And so I was interested to, the, the kernel of physic book came about from a thought experiment, and the thought experiment was, if you are an educated and rational person who is living in 17th century Massachusetts and the, the reasonable thing to do, the government sanctioned, rational, reasonable thing to do is to have a witch trial. Mm -hmm. What does the world look like? Mm -hmm. you know, what does the world look like to you? Um, your understanding of the physical realm is very different from our understanding of the physical realm. I was interested in the ways that Puritan religious thought informed their understanding of how the world literally worked around us. And of course I was also interested in some of the gender politics around it. Uh, around it. You know, what did it feel like to be a, a woman in this moment in time you know, with the risk that if you expressed too much anger or were too much out of step with your culture that you could pay for that with your life. Mm -hmm. And so the Physic Book of Deliverance Dane is, really tells, attempts to tell my imagination of a real world where magic is real, but the way that the colonists believed it to be, uh, rather than the way that the more kind of fairy tale kind of way. And what did it feel like to go through that trial being a woman in that time? Period? Incidentally, and this is, I'm absolutely uh, serious about this, only the day before yesterday, Nepal finally outlawed uh, accusations of uh, witchcraft. It, um, it, it was. It was really. Uh, it's yeah, not it's, surprise. It's that yeah. doesn't surprise me. Actually, it was. Yeah. I believe that the people who were condemned in Massachusetts were only finally pardoned as part of the 400th anniversary <laughs> really? celebration. Yeah. If I'm not yeah. mistaken, well. don't quote me on that though. There are countries that still prosecute witches. You can mm -hmm. still be put to death as a witch in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, witchcraft is often used as a as a proxy for other things. Um, I have more to say about it than I could say about it, but. I also thought it was important because we keep worrying away at Salem in part because it forces us to reckon with some of our most dearly held myths about our own culture. That mm. we, you know, it's, it's a, an organizing myth that we are a tolerant society. It's an mm -hmm. organizing myth that we, a like, rational society. that we are rational, that yeah. we embrace difference, that we embrace religious plurality. And Salem forces us to reconsider those things or at least forces us to recognize that those ideals are hard one and must be actively maintained. Hmm. Beautifully said. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts? Great question, yes. So uh, we learned from Gregory that you knew at a young age that you liked writing and were in, I don't know if you knew that you wanted to be a writer, but I was curious about the other two of you whether you knew at a young age that that was what you wanted to do for a profession and also whether you would have any advice for other young people that might mm -hmm. be thinking about mm -hmm. doing that themselves. So yeah, I absolutely knew um, when I was a kid that I wanted to be a writer. Um, and in fact, a, a novel that I wrote as a teenager, The Game of Sunken Places, I later revised and, and published. It wasn't my first published novel, but it was the first one that I wrote. Um, and uh, yeah, I always wanted to, which is great because I really have no skills. So, uh, <laughs> you know, um, but yeah. And um, as for advice, I mean, I feel like, uh, I mean, one thing is to read as widely and also as variously as possible to not limit yourself to the genre that you love, but also check. And by reading um, outside of your genre, I mean, also things like you know, I mean, uh, Babylonian prayers, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, um, journals devoted to, uh, 
you know, selling um, implements for pizza making, you know, um, uh, you know, instruction books for the dryer. Every way that you, people use language is another way of, of people understanding the world. And it gives you a sense of how people understand the world very differently. And so reading, I think, very variously, regardless of what you will write, it will enlarge your sense of how language can be used. Um, I, would, I would agree. I knew when I was a very small kid, or I discovered writing when I was a very small kid, and it was something I did so much that I didn't even notice I was doing it. You know, for a while I thought that I wanted to be a serious musician, and I didn't notice that I had to force myself to practice my instrument, whereas with writing I didn't even <laughs> pay attention. Like, I'd write for hours without even necessarily... What was you know, your things. instrument? What has languished? Uh, a double bass. Mm. Classical oh, wow. double bass. Nice. A big future yeah. classical double bass, especially for five foot eight inch women. <laughs> um, and the advice that I would give to a, a small person who is interested in writing is to just kind of do what I did, to write all the time, you know, mm. to, to keep a journal, to write dumb limericks, to try and do silly haikus, uh, to kind of get into the habit of writing every day, even if it's not in the service of a greater project, because I think that the, the habit of it is what is the most important thing, that if you cultivate in yourself the sense that when you sit down to write, you are at peace and doing what you most want to be doing in that moment, or mm. even what you need mm -hmm. to be doing in that moment, um, that I think is a very important skill. And it sometimes requires a certain amount of selfishness uh, because it means not playing with your friends for that couple of hours or not sailing or not doing whatever it is that you would maybe rather be doing or that other people might wish that you were doing. Um, and so I was fortunate to be raised in a household that encouraged me in that solitary pursuit. Uh, and I think it's very important for any writer to have the people who love you also love that you write. Well, I was fortunate that I had no friends, so. <laughs> <laughs> but the, See, I had no siblings, and so it was, it was, it was easier that way, too. Mm -hmm. I, the, the ben Sean in, in um, The Shape of Content makes the point that you make, Tobin, and that you make, too, about exposing yourself as a young writer to everything and not just not just to the written word but he says mm -hmm. if the one thing you can't stand for instance is oh um you know the red sox game is broadcast on the radio then right. listen to the red sox game right. Broad right if you can't stand christian music then listen right. to christian music I mean, look how meatloaf used a uh, a ball game an announced ball game in uh, bad out of hell <laughs> did he well, in uh, yeah, in Paradise by the Dashboard Lights. Oh, right. There's a, there's a brilliant use that. of. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I thought Meatloaf was a food group. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's a rock musician. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I think that one of the central things is also um, you know through practice, through um, bouncing off of yourself the sort of all these linguistic worlds is. You want to try to find the, the, the way of writing the voice that is particularly yours. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that a lot of times um, we have this fear when we're uh, young writers, we need to write something that's like something else so that we're safe, so that we don't expose ourselves. But in fact, the, um, the opposite really, I mean, the thing that people are interested in is the thing that makes you you that is not like them, mm -hmm. as opposed to the thing that is most like them. Mm -hmm in many ways. That's going to be the thing that reveals something that no one else knows and that's what's going to catch our attention. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I would say, is to seek out those things that are very particularly you mm -hmm. and to lean into them. But in a more prosaic way, you could also say, and this is what I said to myself as a kid, I mean I said it actually, not, not just subconsciously, but really I'd say, okay, I'm, I'm 30 pages into this story, I'm in seventh grade, and <laughs> I'm 30 pages into this story, and um, I'm getting bored with it. If this were a book I was reading in the library and it suddenly got really good, mm. what would happen next? And yeah. then I would write that. Okay. That was my, I, I was kind yeah. of, my, you know, my instructors in writing were all were the 10,000 books that I read. And mm. the fact yeah. that I could see you could do anything if you were, uh, you know, so maybe, maybe they're not going to get married. Right. Oh, that's interesting. So mm -hmm. what yeah. happens next? And so you, you just, and I, I think that's, I mean, that's still how I write. Mm -hmm. Something, you know, yeah. that's how I write writing yeah. after Alice. Mm -hmm. What would I like? What would I like this book to be like? If somebody had written a book about Lydia on the on the on the riverbank, mm -hmm. what would it be like? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we're trying to write that book. Mm -hmm. Was there were there any other questions?
questions out there before I close out? I want to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Well, before I release you, and let me remind everybody that there are books for sale and our authors will be happy to sign them. Um, you're talking about reading and the importance of reading, and I agree, all the, you know, the best teachers for me have been the best writers that I have read. Mm -hmm. um, would each of you share with us something unexpectedly wonderful that you've read recently? Um, I, I know I always hate it when I'm asked that because I think, oh my God, you know, I knew a minute ago. Exactly, and now it goes out of my head. I'm, yeah. I'm still Anything? reading something right now. Most of what I read is for research, actually. I, I don't get to read a whole lot of fiction because I write historical fiction, so I spend a lot of time steeped in historical books. So right now I'm reading a book called Low Life by a guy named Luc Santé, which came out in the 1990s mm -hmm. and which is about the world of vice in New York City, specifically the Bowery, uh, in the early part of the 19th century. And it's all about, it's about the gambling and the prostitution mm -hmm. and about the, the theater world and the immigrant world. And it's terrific. It's just really mm -hmm. engagingly written. And, and so I see some people nodding, so it sounds like maybe some of you know this book already, but I hadn't read it before. And it is fabulous, and I can't wait to get back to it. Well, I've, I've, th this past year I've read five or six books about Charles Darwin because mm -hmm. Uh, Darwin's, you know, the, the great crash into the culture of his revelations happened in the 1860s when mm. Alice in Wonderland was published. Mm. So mm. that's it's a really cool connection. It is, is a really cool mm. connection with all those talking animals and yeah, all the, and all, all those yeah. things changing before their eyes, yeah. and that's part of the the, the tension in the story. Mm -hmm. um, mm. But I, one of my, one of my brothers said to me about a month ago, um, has anyone read The Idiot? <laughs> and I thought that was a Steve Marks, uh, or I mean, a, a, what is, you know, Steve, um, Martin. Steve Martin, Martin, you know, yeah. movie or something. That's the jerk. <laughs> That's the jerk. Yeah. Yeah. So I yeah. thought, no, it's not Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Right. So I'm reading The Idiot because I never read it before. Huh? And, I'm, and I'm, I'm very pleased to find it's going down, you know, like a milkshake. <laughs> that is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't expect to be able to say that. So, <laughs> but and uh, to, to follow on with that, oddly enough, I was about to say a, um, a, a two generations later than Dostoevsky, um, Yuri Olesha's Envy, which I just read, uh, which is really wonderful. But the neat thing about it is you can really see the influence. So he's writing in the 1930s. You can really feel the influence of Dostoevsky, in particular, on him. In that it's a book about these people having these um, insane monologues about crazy ass shit that actually, <laughs> the neat thing is it actually propels a lot of their, you know, um, a lot of the action there. Uh -huh. So it's very Dostoevskyan. Well, I'll borrow yeah. it when you're done. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, everybody, please give. Thank you. Thank you.